Right. Hopefully everyone can see that uh, that now. So for the next 20 minutes, um, I intend to give you an overview about how climate change is affecting the insurance market and the impact that it's going to have on clients and what risk management can be done to try and help protect um, yourselves about the changes. So the risks of climate change can really be split into two main categories. There's physical and transitional risks. The physical risk, risks relate to temperature changes where we can experience longer, more frequent heat waves, more intense dry periods, plus rising coastal water levels and increasing frequency of heavy rainfall. Transitional risks relate to the changes in legislation and regulation and investment pressures as public opinions surrounding not green sectors change. So one of the biggest threats physical risks pose to um, is essentially food production. A recent report done by Lloyds of London examining businesses and insurance implications of food safety and securities identifies food insecurity as one of the largest risks to global society over the next 10 years. While there are a number of factors at play, climate change is considered to be one of the most important um, supply uh, drivers within this and the potential to change global food markets and with it the supply of these products. Unfortunately, as has been um, identified by the previous speakers, um, the vulnerable countries um, will be the ones that will suffer the most and it's predicted by 2050 that child malnutrition is anticipated to be 20% higher than it would have been the case without climate change. So take the mild winters that we seem to be frequently experiencing, experiencing in the UK. Dr. Harrington conducted an insect, insect survey back in 2008 and found that as a direct result of the milder winters, aphids seeking new sources of food are appearing significantly earlier and in greater numbers, which means more aphids in spring and early summer crops when crops are particularly vulnerable to damage. The increase in aphids, one of the UK's main ag agricultural pests, has potential insurance implications to the agricultural insurance and environmental liability policies. But there's also a greater risk to vehicles being caught up in floodwaters. Whether it's vehicles getting flooded whilst parked or drivers driving through floodwater, and I've just realised that I'm on the wrong slide there. <laughs> um, so there was an image of a car floating under a bridge in Aberdeen, which uh, we effectively insured. Um, but properties are also at greater risk, whether it be from high stormy seas, rivers flooding, or flooding caused by excess surface water. There we go, there's the picture that I was talking about. <laughs> And as we've got the other extreme as well, which is drought, dry parched land um, where wildfires can start easily and spread quickly and they put livestock at risk. In 2020, I attended a conference with LV Insurance uh, virtually, and this they said that they dealt with more subsidence and flood claims than ever before. This was partly due to the fact that the soil which the buildings were built on was identified as being in a moisture deficit due to the lack of rainwater, which created subsidence problems for the buildings. But then when the rain did come, it ran off the land and caused localised flooding because the compacted land couldn't absorb the rain sufficiently. And when you've got extreme weather events such as storms, hurricanes and tornadoes, you might think that these wouldn't affect your insurance policies, but actually the London insurance market, including Lloyds of London, underwrites a significant portion of global insurance contracts for risks relating to weather related natural catastrophes. Meanwhile, the UK storms, Chiara and Dennis, brought heavy rainfall to parts of the UK during February 2020 and actually caused rivers in England to reach record levels. The UK Met Office said February 2020 was the wettest February on record and the fifth wettest month ever recorded in the UK. And then finally, increasing working temperatures as well are a problem for potential employees and does pose an increased risk. Although not necessarily in Aberdeen, but certainly for companies that operate in hot countries, this is a risk which needs to be managed correctly. So the transitional risks. Um, 
as we've kind of already discussed, insurers do rely heavily on investment income to, count, un, to counteract underwriting losses. The, gro the global transition to a low, lower carbon economy could have an impact on insurance firms through their investments in carbon incentive assets. And let's not underestimate the volume of premiums which companies operating in the oil and gas sector bring to the table. The premium written is substantial, and if the oil and gas sector declines, the gross written premium also declines. So pressure on the supply chain could also intensify as insurers look to use more environmentally friendly, sustainable companies to supply their parts and building materials. This could result in further price increases as the demand outstrips supply of more environmentally friendly source materials local to the UK. But probably the biggest risk of all is uh, new sources of liability claims. So historical events have shown that over time, liability claims can be more disruptive to the insurance industry than losses caused by individual extreme weather events, especially when new sources of claims emerge. For example, take asbestos and pollution liability claims. These demonstrate how, at the time, they appeared to be really low risks to the insurers, but actually, over time, they transformed into large and unforeseen liabilities for insurers and cost them an awful lot of money. Companies could be accused of failure to mitigate, for example, causing public liability claims to arise through emissions of greenhouse gases, and companies could be held directly responsible and liable for loss or damage to third parties as a result. There are, be, there are some um, high profile cases um, in the states where individuals have actually tried to litigate against, against utility and energy companies, but uh, none, none of these have been successful, thankfully, but it is a worrying trend where several US states have brought a lawsuit against various power companies arguing that the company's carbon emissions, emissions created a public nuisance. Companies could also be accused of not sufficiently accounting for climate risk change factors in their decision making. In principle, this could apply to a range of climate change related risk factors, but not just those from physical risks such as storms and floods, but the governance of economic or financial issues that are material to corporate risk of return. Failure to disclose or comply with potential climate change legislation or regulation could cause claims in this category due to insured parties which have not significantly disclosed information relevant to climate change. So the true cost of liability claims going forward could be uncertain and complex to determine. And these new areas will make it very difficult for insurers to price liability policies accurately. So how does this relate to you? being in Aberdeen or throughout Scotland. Unfortunately, um, Aberdeen, we have seen our fair share of storms. In 2021, we were hit by heavy flooding in August and October, and most recently, Storm Arwen in November 21, which brought severe winds across the UK. There were huge power outages, and these were lengthy due to the number of trees that came down on electricity cables. Many homes and cars were damaged by falling trees as well. As these individual claims add up, if we go back to the storms which hit, Feb hit the UK in February 2020, these resulted in an insured property market loss, which was estimated at £425 million and is still rising, which makes it the costliest flood event in the UK since the winter floods of December 2015, which cost the insurance industry £1.1 billion. Once upon a time, these events could be classified as one-offs, but insurers are predicting that due to the changing the, the climate change and the volatility in the weather, this is now the new normal. The past is no longer a prediction of the future, so insurers are having to determine new ways to model existing risks and take into account new emerging risks to business owners, such as an increased risk for directors and officers. So a directors and officers insurance contract covers the personal liabilities of the directors and officers of a company that results from acts or emissions committed. So claim there could be future claims based on a failure to disclose information in relation to risks associated with climate change. In the future, a company or its board may need to disclose information about greenhouse gas emissions, set goals and timetables for management to reduce emissions, and analyse risk and opportunities created by climate change. 
future directors and officers may face both regulatory and shareholder action if they fail to adequately consider misrepresent or conceal climate related change information. This would all be picked up under a D and O policy. There could also be increased professional indemnity risk. So climate change related claims and professional indemnity would most probably involve professionals such as architects, surveyors or engineers who fail to adapt or take into account the implications of weather changes linked to climate change, which could give rise to professional indemnity claims. So how would this affect your insurance policy? So as businesses and individuals around the world work to reduce climate change, firms are also taking action to manage the financial risk it presents. For insurers, it will, be specific, it will specifically affect underwriting, pricing, policy coverage and reserving, which will in turn affect policyholders. So if we start with underwriting, every policy starts um, with the basic underwriting. This is when your broker will present your risk to an insurer to get the price for your risk. When insurers look at risk, they take into account a number of factors that help them to determine if the risk is within appetite and what price to charge. So take, for example, a traditional manufacturing business. The insurer ideally would like to know wages, turnover, what manual processes are being done, health and safety, safety measures in place, what the building construction is, so if there's any composite panels, um, intruder alarm and fire protection measures. However, insurers are now also likely to be using comprehensive flood mapping software behind the scenes, which will give detailed information drilled right down to address level and include the risk of coastal surges, rivers flooding and also surplus surface water. So this can lead to risks being reclassified as being in flood areas or perhaps they aren't in flood areas. Insurers may refuse to offer terms based on flood mapping information. Um, ourselves as a broker, we've already experienced this happening. And if the computer says no, and there's no override, there's little appetite from the underwriter to listen to any reason which potentially we could give. And that's really how fearful underwriters are of the risks of flooding. They know if they get their flood mapping wrong, it will lead to an overexposure and a high volume of claims. So if we take the insurance property market as an example, back in 2019, property insurance premiums were very low for a considerable amount of time and it all came to a head that year when insurers lost money on this class of business. They were all hoping for an uneventful 2020, but unfortunately they had a terrible start to the year and this was one of the reasons why many businesses and property owners have seen their property insurance premiums increase during 2021. So even though your business or property may, may not have been directly affected, affected by the floods, insurance operates as a pot of risks. The basic principle of insurance is that the losses of the few are paid for by the premiums of the many. You will be placed in a pot with similar types of risks depending on your own unique risk factors. But insurers also have to make sure they aren't overexposed. So some of the clients that you share that pot with well, we'll be based throughout the whole of the UK and may have been subject to severe flooding. So setting the right premium for the risk is going to become increasingly challenging due to climate change. An increase in temperature of say 1% is, can be misleading for underwriters to work with because it will have a different impact on the actual claims that this increase might cause. As already discussed, the insurance industry holds a wealth of historical data which it readily re relies upon. And this provides a basis for insurers to react quickly and make underwriting adjustments to annual property contracts after catastrophes. However, this historical data may hinder now pricing going forward because it's not taking into account new climate change science. But new modeling is being developed to incorporate um, the changing of the risk. But insurers do have help. So effectively, if the exposure gets too great for an insurer, they can transfer the risk. And this is called reinsurance. And this helps to shield insurers from the volatility arising from catastrophic events and helps to keep the losses in line with their appetite. Effectively, reinsurance is when insurers actually buy insurance. So by spreading this risk, because reinsurers will insure risks throughout the world, um, they avoid overexposure in a particular area and they act as a, a 
a real stabilizing factor in the local insurance markets, ensuring that in that insurance is available at lower prices than it would be otherwise. So the policy coverage is another key area which could be affected by climate change. So a property damage policy typically covers um, cover for a, a list of specified um, events and each policy is worded slightly differently, but the main perils that are covered, we cover fire, lightning, explosion, aircraft, earthquake, flood, escape of water and impact. So when an insurer suffers a large amount of claims in a particular area, so let's take flood for example, they naturally start to analyse their book of business that they hold to determine if they can do anything to prevent further losses. In some cases, their own insurer may even be imposing these restrictions on the type of risk they can write. So that would result in insurers either withdrawing altogether from certain postcode areas, removing cover, for example, storm or flood damage, or increasing premiums and imposing very high levels of excess for particular risks that are in flood areas. So this is a growing risk as well, that certain perils will actually gradually become uninsurable, for example, flood and perhaps wildfires as well. Reserve setting um, is the final piece to this jigsaw. So when a claim is intimated, insurers have to set a reserve on what they anticipate the claim will settle at. Um, reserving is very important to get right for insurers. If they reserve too high, they endanger premium rate increases that would make them uncompetitive going forward, too low, and they are in danger of making losses. Reserving models are becoming harder due to the impact of climate change and major storms becoming more frequent, so their formulas perhaps aren't working so efficiently. So I just wanted to end the presentation by giving you, I suppose, my best advice from as, a, as an insurance broker. Um, unfortunately, um, our assets are at risk due to climate change, and the best thing that we can do is to make sure or you can do is to make sure that you engage with the services of a professional insurance broker to ensure you have the right cover in place should the worst happen. At the moment the biggest risk to businesses and individual assets um, would be flooding and damage to property from falling trees during storms. So your best line of defence is to make sure that all material facts are to your broker are disclosed and that includes um, if there are any tall trees next to your property. That way, if a tree does come down during a storm, there'll be no debate over the damage caused. Tall trees should also be inspected. And you know, if you're in any doubt as to the health of a tree, then a tree surgeon should be um, involved to assess the, the, the state of the tree. And if you're at the risk of flooding, uh, sandbags are a good aid to have on hand. But there is protection for private homes that are based in flood areas, and that is Floodry. So this is a joint initiative that, which is between the government and the insurance industry. And the aim of Floodry is to make flood cover part of the flood cover part of the household policies more affordable. So every insurer that offers home insurance in the UK must pay into flood re. However, only houses that are built prior to 2009 actually qualify for the scheme. And unfortunately, the scheme doesn't apply to commercial or business properties um, either at the moment. Um, and it doesn't apply to rented out properties either. So if the worst were to happen and you were a victim of a flood or um, some storm damage, um, my last bit of advice would be don't get caught out by the, the average clause. Um, it's quite a common, um, we see it quite commonly that buildings aren't insured for the correct amounts that they should be insured for. So many people think that buildings should be based on their market value, which and that is not the case. It should be the reinstatement value. So if you declare that your property rebuild cost is £100,000, when in fact it's near £150,000, the insurer will invoke the clause of average and will reduce your claim by the percentage it was un underinsured by. So in, in this example, if you've underinsured your property by 50%, in the event of a total loss claim, the maximum amount you would get out would be £50,000. So it is the responsibility of policyholders to get the rebuild figure correct. And I suppose a, a good example um, to end on 
with regard to the rebuild cost and um, the reinstatement cost is that um, our own building up in Elgin, actually, we had to get um, revalued recently. And it's a beautiful listed traditional building uh, on the high street in Elgin. And it was valued at £140,000, but the rebuild value was £1.7 million to rebuild it. So that is the difference. So if someone took the market value and um, assumed that, that was the rebuild cost, you could see quite clear, quite quickly how um, you can be quite dramatically underinsured as that example. So I hope you found my presentation useful and happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. Well, it's really so we're all going to hurry away now and just look at our insurance codes to make sure that, that we've insured them in, in the right amount now.